Welcome back, Care Blazer, to another episode of Care Blazers TV. I'm so excited to share with you this interview I did with Denise Brown. She is the owner of Caregiving Years Training Academy, an online space where she offers support to family caregivers, and she has multiple different forums that she does this. I'm going to be sure to link to all of her links below, but interestingly, the way that Denise Brown got introduced to me was, you might remember, about a month ago, I interviewed Dr. Regina Kep, and she talked about the six stages of caregiving, and you guys loved that video. Well, turns out, Denise Brown also created uh, six stages of caregiving, very similar to what Dr. Kep presented on. So I got really curious about who is Denise Brown and uh, some of the amazing work she did. And she was gracious enough to come on the show and share some of her experience, not only as a professional helping family members who are caring for a loved one with a variety of different healthcare conditions, but also her own personal journey. She is the caregiver and daughter of her two parents who are currently 86 and 89. They live a few minutes down the road. She's involved in their care and really helps coordinate a lot of the care that her parents receive. In this interview today, she's gonna to talk about palliative care and how she was able to get her parents to be more receptive to having palliative care in the home. She's also gonna talk about this term called compassion fatigue and how caregivers can realistically start to do things in their day-to-day -day life to really help reduce their compassion fatigue, to help reduce their stress. What I like about how this interview goes is that we talk about some things, she brings up some things that you can start doing right away that aren't necessarily talked about all the time. They're not like the usual things you would often hear when it comes to how to deal with caregiver stress, how to deal with compassion fatigue. So I hope you really enjoyed this interview I did with Denise Brown. Before we jump into that interview, I wanna share with you that this is the last day to join my care course. This is my signature program. It is the best program I can offer to any care blazer if you are interested in lowering stress, lowering overwhelm, lowering worry, and being able to show up in the best way possible for your loved one and for yourself. If you're interested in learning more, please click the link in the description below. It'll take you to my online care course website where you can learn all kinds of information. Today's the last day, it's the deadline. I hope to be welcoming you in the course soon. Now, let's jump into this interview with Denise Brown. Denise, welcome to the channel. I'm so excited to have you here today. I've already introduced you to my audience, but I would love to hear from you in terms of how you got into the field of offering help to caregivers and a little bit about your own personal caregiving journey. First of all, Natalie, thank you so much for having me on. I'm thrilled to be on your channel. You do amazing work. So <laughs> it's you. awesome to be with you today. Thank you. I I started working with family caregivers actually in 1990. I'm a writer by practice and trade, and I was in the midst of a career change because what I was writing about, I didn't feel really mattered. So I wanted to kind of branch out and see what else was out there in the world. And I started helping older adults in a small town in New Jersey. And that's how I started connecting with family caregivers because I managed this nutrition site Older adults came for a hot meal Monday through Friday, and then their adult children would call me and say, did my mom come today for lunch? How did she look to you? And then I moved into the office, so to speak, and I managed a respite care program in this rural county in New Jersey. And just hearing the stories of family caregivers as a writer was so compelling to me. Every family caregiver has the elements of a great story in their experience. There's mystery, there's com comedy, there's drama, all the good elements of a great story. So that's what kept me really involved in helping and supporting family caregivers. And then in 1995, I decided that there was a need in the space for support directly for family caregivers. So I actually launched a print publication called Caregiving, and then I launched a website, which was an online community hub. Wow. Yeah, that's super interesting. And then somewhere along the way, you started having your own personal experience with caregiving. When did that start and how did that look? So in 2004, my father was diagnosed with bladder cancer. 
and then he had major surgery because the cancer spread in 2015. And it was at the same time that my mom started uh, experiencing a significant health crisis. So they were both very ill at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they're now 89 and 86. They live 10 minutes from me. I help them. I have a niece who helps them. And then we have home health and palliative care. So we've put together a team that keeps them in a good place. And they really help each other too. Someone had described it to me a couple of years ago as they're two halves of a whole. So together they can make it work. And my mom actually, you could say is my dad's family caregiver in many ways, because she manages his ostomy care because he Mm -hmm. had his bladder removed because of the cancer. And then my dad helps my mom by meal preparation and support for her. Wow, that's great. I think a lot we hear about caregivers who are actually in the home caring for their loved one, which is such a huge, wonderful thing that so many people around the world are doing. I think what we don't hear a lot about are caregivers who might be living down the road for them or in a different city or state than them, but there are still very much caregiving demands that come along with that. Can you speak a little bit to what you do as a caregiver who is down the road from your parents and how that kind of caregiving might look? So first of all, I worry. So I think anytime you are worried about a family member who has a health condition, you are a family caregiver. Worry is the prevalent emotion of our experience. So (laughs) I try to manage my worries around them. And I also manage really the care team. And I have really advocated for them to receive more help. So for instance, I really pushed for them to agree to palliative care. Uh I really pushed for them to receive home health care. My father had a fall in October of 2020. And when he came home from the hospital, it was clear they were going to need more help. And so my mom, with my planting the seed, said, let's think about having Sarah, who's my niece, help out. So it's really organizing and trying to stay a step ahead of a disease process. And I think everybody knows how hard that is. So regardless of where you live, you're always trying to think of what could happen next? And then what am I getting ready for that could happen next? And sometimes next is the next moment. Sometimes it's the next afternoon, the next day, the next week. So you're always thinking about, okay, what am I really planning to manage next. Yeah, I like that. You could also apply that to like planning for the next stage of dementia, you know, thinking about my care blazers. Exactly. Absolutely. So you're staying informed about a disease process. Yeah, you're really being almost an observer to what you're seeing with your family member and then deciding, okay, based on what I'm seeing, this is where we could be. So I know this is what could happen next. Yeah. And so I know we're going to talk about compassion fatigue is the main topic we're going to talk about today, but I want to um, just go to what you mentioned when you said palliative care and you had to talk to your parents about being open to that. I think this is a really important piece I don't want to miss. And I think a lot of care blazers could benefit from. Can you talk briefly about how you introduced that to your parents and how maybe they responded and what you did to help them become receptive to palliative care. And if you can, just like a brief sentence or two about what that is and how you explained it to them. Cause I think a lot of people hear palliative care and they think I'm, I'm not going to die soon. And they kind of, um, you know, kind of push back against it, but that's not necessarily what palliative care is. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And for someone who's caring for someone with dementia, really think about palliative care, really start to talk to the doctor about when to, when palliative care might be available, because it helps manage basically a disease and its symptoms. So it's not about curing something. It's about managing the symptoms of a disease. And with palliative care, it's not a lot of help but it's a nurse practitioner who visits my parents every six weeks or so in their apartment. So we don't have to leave to go to an an appointment. And then she does a very thorough exam and she talks about what symptoms they might be having, how they're feeling. We look at weight. She checks their ankles. She looks at the bottom of their feet, all those things that are so important for a doctor to do, but it's just in the comfort of the home. And because I am realistic about where my parents are in their life, they're 89 and 86, I know that end of life is coming. I want to have a smooth transition from palliative care to hospice care. 
because hospice care is a provider. And if I wait too long to introduce a provider, I might accidentally introduce chaos. And I wanna introduce a progression of services and I wanna introduce the right provider. So we're getting used to what it's like to use this palliative care provider, which also provides hospice. That way, when we move into hospice, it's not introducing all these new components of care. Yeah, it's a smooth transition. And just, I'll be, I did a video on what hospice care is, so I'll link it below. But um, I love that you're kind of introducing these things earlier. Yes. Did, did your mom and dad push back when you brought this topic up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my mom in particular, because what we were looking at was a hospice provider, yeah. even though they provide palliative care. So for my mom, it was, oh, I don't know. And I actually really introduced, let's let's find the right provide provider. I'd love for you to consider these three providers. Yeah. And then we met with the first one, which is a well-known organization in our area. And my mom said, I just want to go with them. I don't want to talk to anybody else. Mm. And now there's no pushback. Yeah. They know who the nurse practitioner is. They like how she does the examinations. They like the suggestions that she's they offer. So it was something that was so basic that they suggested after the first appointment that I kind of was like, why didn't I think of that? But so my mom has limited mobility and the nurse practitioner suggested that she walk up and down the hallway in the apartment building. Mm -hmm. Now that is so simple to do. And now my mom takes a walk up and down the hallway twice a day and she's wow. committed to it. She's very, she does not want to die. So she's doing everything within her power. She rides her stationary bike every day. And then she takes wow. these walks. Your it's mom fun. sounds like she's doing pretty amazing. Yeah. She's very determined, which is good, right? It's good. Yeah. And it's also <laughs> difficult for the adult children. It's the blessing and the curse. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And just as a little teaching point for care blazers, hospice always includes palliative care. Palliative care is really like um, symptom management, like you mentioned, and quality of life. Um, so hospice always includes palliative care. Palliative care doesn't always include hospice. It's like the precursor to hospice. So, but a lot of people put them in the same bucket. So when they hear palliative care, they freak out, but um, I appreciate you spending some time just sharing that with us. Cause that's probably a topic for another video but I think a lot of care blazers might go investigate a little bit on what palliative care is and maybe talk to a primary care doctor about something like that. Yes, especially because you're caring for a family member with dementia and it you're not looking at curing a disease right. process. So that is something right. to remember that palliative care is a resource for you. Yeah, awesome. So compassion fatigue, can you spend some time what is compassion fatigue? Like, talk oh, about it. Yeah. So actually, I have struggled with understanding what compassion fatigue is. Okay. And so what I finally figured out is that it's compassion fatigue for myself, meaning that I have felt so much for others that I've lost the ability to feel for myself. And I also really started looking at the definition of compassion fatigue. It felt too big for me to really feel like I could take care of it. And when I got more specific about what wore me out, I then could implement some strategies to feel better. And I think, but, oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, what's the difference between compassion fatigue and stress? Like, I, I think a lot of caregivers experience a lot of stress. Compassion fatigue sounds like it might be in the same bubble. Again, it might be another word that's really big and encompasses a lot, but um, go ahead to just share your thoughts on uh, what you were going to say and what maybe the differences are there. That's actually such a great question, and I'm not really sure what the difference is, so I'm going to talk it out loud, but I feel like compassion fatigue feels like utter depletion, like it's all gone. And with stress, there's still some energy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still a little frazzled, you're wringing your hands, maybe you're pacing. So there's some activity with stress. And with compassion fatigue, I just feel like you are just a lump on the couch, there's no energy because it's all gone. You've given it all away. What do you think? How does that sound to you? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that makes sense. Uh, when I think about compassion fatigue, you know, and stress, like stress, you can be stressed on all kinds of things, right? And there's good stress and bad stress. And uh, I think the majority of people can relate when they hear the word stress, they kind of intuitively know what that means. Compassion fatigue is, it's a, it's a drain from having compassion and caring. It's like from having like 
that care for somebody from constantly giving of yourself to somebody that it comes with this whole other level of fatigue, depletion, um, risking of burnout. And it's really from that place of love and caring that it really starts to happen. And I think a lot of times uh, caregivers are giving so much of themselves to other people that sometimes they forget themselves in the process or they feel like it's impossible to really give themselves that time and attention that literally they're, they're feeling drained of all the compassion and care they're giving. Right. So there's so much that's going out. There's nothing left for me. And I think when you feel that way, there's a hopelessness to that experience too, where you feel like I've lost myself. I was also thinking this week that sometimes you feel like you've lost your future Mm. because you can't figure out what the future is going to be like. And that's a hard place to live. And in a caregiving experience, that's very common. A diagnosis changes everything, including our expectations of the future. And then then as the disease progresses and we give up more and more to accommodate the disease, it feels like we're left with what? I I think about two family caregivers. One was caring for her family member with dementia, her husband with dementia, and another one was caring for her husband with cancer. And they just happened to connect in a chat room that I used to have. And you would think, well, you know, what would they really have in common? Their diseases are different. The progression of the diseases are different. But what they found was this common loss around what they had to give up because of caregiving. And they gave up taking road trips in their RVs. So they had this really important conversation about what that was like when they sold their RVs, what the last trip was like that they took with their husbands. Those are the kinds of connections that are so important to know you're not the only one that doesn't arrive in a future that you thought you would have and that you have to adjust to this future. Sometimes that's hard to do. And especially if you're burnt out, you don't have that energy to think, okay, it's not what I thought, but I can, I can create something here that's good for me and good for my life. Absolutely. I think this speaks to the greater picture of how much loss is involved when dementia or any significant medical condition, you know, happens to a loved one. You start to realize not only all the loss in the moment, like in the present moment, it's the loss of the future, you know, loss of retirement plans of traveling the country in an RV, loss of being able to visit grandchildren and play with them and, you know, do things with um, the grandchildren that it's just loss after loss after loss. And yeah, that that is one of the hardest things. But you mentioned you have to, uh, it's one of those things you have to accept, you have to be able to figure out how do we want to live with the reality of all this loss. Absolutely. And it's important that you have understanding and support around the losses that you're coping with. Mm -hmm. And it's only someone else who has something similar happen in their life that can really understand that. So that's why your work is so important because you connect people who understand, who have similar experiences. So you don't feel so alone in it. Like you're the only one that's struggling with this tough life. There's others who struggle with a tough life too. Yeah. And it it still doesn't, it doesn't make your situation any easier. You know, like it doesn't take away the pain and the difficulty, but there is something about knowing I'm not alone, you know, and then being able to connect with other people. That's why support groups and things like that are so great for people. Um, Being able to like, just touch base with somebody and even people who can relate, you know, sometimes I find some caregivers will maybe try to relate with other family members who aren't as involved and they, you know, everybody has their judgments and their opinions. And sometimes that can add to the stress. And so having somebody who is a caregiver on that same level and just being able to bounce back, like my Careblazer community is just amazing. I have a closed Facebook group where they pretty much, I just in awe at all these Careblazers who have such compassion fatigue, stress, burnout, watching what they thought would be the future kind of change entirely, and yet still pour out so much love into the other care blazers who are struggling. Like they just offer so much support to one another. And I do think even though it doesn't actually change your caregiving situation, doesn't take away any of your challenges, there is something really healing in knowing that 
this stranger, maybe across the world, you know, on the other side of the ocean is offering me some support right now. And that can be incredibly healing. You know, what I have figured out is that an opportunity can provide healing Mm -hmm. because that's when you reconnect to, oh my gosh, I have a future because there's an opportunity for me Mm -hmm. and that heals you. So we think about a caregiving experience as something that has significant losses. But if we think about who we become during caregiving, there's significant gains in it too. So we're this amazing crisis manager. We have these awesome skills that help us go out into the world and navigate really stressful situations every day. I mean, that's amazing what we do during caregiving. Yeah, I think a lot of people can easily say, oh, I know about all the losses. I know about all the stresses that are coming with caregiving. Can you speak a little bit? I I mean, I think there might be some people listening. I totally agree with you, but there might be some people listening who are so stressed out right now or have so much compassion fatigue that they're like, what gains could possibly come from this? You know, can you speak a little bit about what some of those might be? Sure. So you actually just talked about one where you have a support group where others are showing up in support of each other. That's a profound purpose. And when you're feeling lost and alone for having to have someone else come up to you and say, I feel your pain too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share your experience with you. So you're not alone in your pain. That's a huge gain to be able to profoundly help someone in that kind of way, such a unique talent, such an unusual gift. That's a huge gain to be able to be with someone in pain because we're in pain and we know how hard it is for others, right? So you talked about those family members who don't get it. It's because they can't be with us during pain because they don't know what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you stay with someone in pain, that is probably one of the most amazing gifts you could give to someone. Mm -hmm. I was talking earlier about the stories of caregiving. I feel like every family caregiver has a book and it could be that a book they write for themselves or a book they self publish or a book that they get a contract to publish. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's an amazing advocate in family caregivers. And I think about the family caregivers that I've encountered over the years and they actually go out and make a difference. So one of the family caregivers I was mentioning earlier, she was one of the RV wives She has been out there advocating on behalf of other family members, other family caregivers of persons with dementia to provide access to palliative care, Mm -hmm. to ensure that they have support. And in particular, because her husband was diagnosed with FTD, she's very active in that community to support Mm -hmm. younger spouses whose husbands might be diagnosed. And it is right there to help them out and help them navigate the system, which makes no sense, right? And it's an awful situation to have that kind of a diagnosis and then to navigate the system. Well, Sharon's right there helping. I mean, that's a huge gain to know that she gets up every day and she has this purpose to help others. That's huge. Yeah. And, you know, yesterday, actually, I got an email from a careblazer who reached out to me to say she, her husband was diagnosed with early onset dementia and she's, well, initially, mild cognitive impairment. It was like very mild and like now starting to get into the mild dementia, but he's very young. And she noticed a huge gap in the community in terms of there's not a lot of resources and information out there for, you know, early onset dementia. And so she created her own group and now she has spouses from all over coming together. And I'm like, this is just a beautiful example of how in your pain you can grow and help others. But I also want to make the point that Carablazer If all you are doing is getting up every day and trying to care for your loved one, that in in and of itself is an amazing feat. Like it's just amazing what the human soul can endure, what they can go through, how much love they can give, how much support they can give, whether it is simply just to the loved one with dementia, which is huge or to a larger group. Like there's no, because I can... I can also start to sense care players are thinking, well, all I do is care for my lover. I'm like, that's, that's the huge thing. That's not like a little (laughs) thing. So wherever you are on that, it's just like, just to pause and just give yourself some credit and kudos that, wow, holy moly, never ever did anybody sign up to say, I'm one day I'm going to care for a loved one with dementia. One day my husband's going to get dementia. I'm going to care for him or my wife or my parent. No, nowhere. But one day life hands you that. And it's never an experience I don't think most people would choose to do, but they show up for it and and they grow from it. And I think that's 
just incredible and speaks to the amazing heart so many humans have. Yet these stories, a lot of times aren't really shown or known unless you're in that caregiving community. I would bet a lot of caregivers in the world until they became a caregiver, never really knew much about this world and just how much uh, the, the human experience could have pain and yet at the same time have so much love and support and offer support. You know, your point is so important, which is we can do what we can do. Right. And if there's a vision that you have for your future, that's what you hold. Mm -hmm. Even if you feel like, well, I can't take action on it. That's okay. Mm Because just having the vision of it Mm -hmm. helps it become a reality. So even if you just take five minutes and think, okay, what's the opportunity that I want in my life that will heal me? Mm -hmm. And then do a visualization five minutes every day where you're in that reality, where it's something that you've done, that you've created, that you've achieved. That's a stress releasing activity for you. And it really starts to create your future because our mind creates what happens to us. Yeah, I love that. I think that's something that's not really talked about a lot. And people might think, well, why would I sit here and think about a positive future or some dream coming true when around me, you know, my life seems to be crumbling. And I like to say, why? Well, that's even more reason. Why not give yourself five minutes as long as it makes you feel good to just imagine what life could be like in the future. We have no idea what it's really going to look like. You had no idea you were going to be in this stressful situation situation right now. So by just imagining the most beautiful thing you can imagine happening in the future, there is no downside to that. But I think a lot of people, when they hear this recommendation you just give, might instantly block up because they they might say that's totally unrealistic, but my life is so different now. And it's like, that's okay. Like you're going to spend all of your time worried about the stress. And, you know, we're thinking, we spend so much time thinking about the worst case scenario and all the negative outcomes that might happen. Just give five minutes of like the best possible outcome. Even if it doesn't happen, you gave yourself an amazing five minutes of just visualization. You know, people might resonate with the word daydream, but like visualization actually has a lot of research behind it. Starts to wire network, uh, neural pathways in your brain can really start to shift your future. And I think that's something uh, that, hasn't been talked about a lot, but for any Careblazer listening that's thinking that sounds like mumbo jumbo, or that sounds like that's not going to be helpful. Honestly, you have nothing to lose. Give yourself two minutes today to just imagine the most peaceful, serene, relaxing future you could possibly imagine. Just go there. It doesn't cause any harm and it's okay. If if you think it's never going to happen, that's fine. Just like give yourself that little mental reprieve. I actually talk myself into these daydreams pretty much every day because I sometimes I'm like, oh, gosh, this was really a tough day. And then I'll say, you actually can control what you think. Why not think about something really fun and yes. inspiring? And so that's right. what I'll do. You know, and I also think we can do it during our last moments before we fall asleep, because mm-hmm. those moments before we fall asleep, really, our body is relaxing. And that's when we start to really kind of think, uh oh, uh oh, mm-hmm. if instead, we start to think, okay, in the future, I'm in a good place. Yeah. My carry is in a good place, wherever that good place is, we are both in a good place, we are both taken care of, we are both okay, we are both okay, that can really calm you before you close your eyes to go to sleep because that's what you want to be able to do is to relax before you can sleep. And the idea that I'm okay, my carry is okay. And I'm okay. My carry is okay. can be really helpful. Yeah. And when we think about how common sleep problems are with the majority of the population and especially caregivers, you just think like you mentioned at the very beginning of this interview as a caregiver, worry happens a lot, well, right? So it's almost like we're training. And when we go to bed and sometimes hit our head on the pillow, it's like, Bing, all these things start to come up. And that's a wonderful opportunity to, like, to really just to start to train your brain to think about some things that you don't normally purposely think about. And actually, I, we'll talk later. I know you have a book coming out, but there was something in one of your chapters in terms of you can have a really negative day. You can have bad things happen. But at any moment, you can just choose to like not necessarily turn it around all the way, but just not let it overshadow your whole day. You can choose a, po- a positive thought. You can choose a healing thought. You can choose a, a thought that brings you some comfort or peace at any moment, even if it feels like everything's crumbling around you. That's always within your control. I really think that's an important piece for people to try to practice. 
because we can't control so many things about a disease process. I mean, that's what's so frustrating. It is out of our control. And I remind myself that what I think is within my control, what I say is within my control, my next action is within my control. That makes me feel better. There's so much uncertainty, but if I'm certain that I have these choices, then I feel a little better about moving into the next moment. Yeah, the only thing we truly have control over in this world is ourselves, how we decide we want to respond. So, and our our brain is going to offer us, you know, thousands and thousands of thoughts a day. We can't control them all, but at any moment we can purposefully choose to think a thought that we think is important to us. And I think for a lot of people, and nobody's really taught this, you know, but a lot of people, we just run on autopilot or on default. And so our brains naturally having a human brain is going to offer us all of these negative thoughts, all of these worst case scenarios. And it's going to look to your environment to say, see, this is true. This is true. You know, my retirement savings is dwindling. My loved one is declining. My, my um, bills are piling up. Like we look to all that evidence and it just like builds and builds and builds and all of that is happening. But at any moment, we can also choose to think, yeah, I'm surviving. Yet here I am. Yet I am still showing love. Yet I'm still a care blazer. I'm yet I'm still here for my loved one. I'm I've made it through every hardship in my life up to now. I'm still making it through this. Like I am an incredibly strong person. None of this is to mean like we wave a magic wand and and take the pain away or the struggle away. It just means that in addition to that, there's also this chance for beauty. There's also this chance to like practice something that could give you even just two seconds of relief. And that's how it starts. And I think it's incredibly important for everybody to have a practice like that. The moment is what we can control. And sometimes what we do is we move too far into the moments. Mm -hmm. And so we start to take care of our future that has yet to arrive. Right. Yeah. So I had a client that I coached and she cared for her mother who had a stroke and her mother lived in her home with her and her husband and her three children. And it was very important to my client that her children were not impacted by caregiving. So it created a lot of stress for her. When her mom would have issues with incontinence, my client would jump into the future and say to me, I can't care for my mom at home. She's incontinent, I'm gonna have to put her in a nursing home and my siblings are gonna be so mad at me. And then I would bring her back to the moment and say, what happened that you had a challenge with incontinence? And then it would turn out into something like, I got busy, and so I was a little late helping my mom to the bathroom. So then we would put a a plan in place so that it was easier for her to help her mom get to the bathroom every two hours. We would think about adding more help so it wasn't just Betty getting her mom to the bathroom every two hours, that she had help in the house so someone could help her mom. We really jump into the future and decide that the future has already happened when it hasn't. But the moment is where we can put our plan in place because I really believe every worry needs a plan. And that's how we stop the spiraling worries when we think, okay, this is what I'm worried about, but what can I do about it? What can I say? What can I act on? What can I decide? So it makes us feel again, that control. Yeah. Worry is one of those things where it feels like we're doing something when we worry, but actually it does nothing but make you feel awful, you know? So we have to figure out what do we want to do there? There's a guy, his name is Peter Crone. He's like a mind coach. He's worked with a lot of highly athletes and stuff. And I'm not going to quite say it as beautifully as he does because his, his words are so eloquent, but he says, whenever we are thinking about some worry or fear in the future, we are literally talking about a time that has not yet occurred. So in a way, it's, it's a something that we're worried about that has not yet happened. It's just a story or some thing we've made up in our mind. So if we're going to go there, which we will, because we have a human brain, why not spend some other time making up a story that actually is a kind of good too? Like, well, if my mom is incontinent, I'm incontinent and I'm not able to do it and I can't work around it. This might be an opportunity where my sisters all pitch in and we all come together. Or we all buy like w- that could be totally make believe. But so is the part where everybody is against you. Right. Because neither one has happened. So when we when we actually like, step back and think, wait a minute, we're worried about something that hasn't happened, which means it's totally made up in our mind at this point. Let me also make up something positive. You know, and I think that's a little bit some people, again, will be like, whoa, that's a little bit out there. But I'm like, but why not? What's the downside again? What is the downside of going there? Some people might think, well, you know, um, it's delusional. I'm like, well, in a way, it's also delusional to think that you can predict the future and know exactly how everybody's going to respond. So just, you know, and we have to learn ways to think 
that support us instead of constantly be- beating us down. And if we just run with our kid, like our brain is like a little toddler with scissors running around half the time. If we just let it run wild and loose, it can do some pretty scary things. So t- sometimes we have to say, wait a minute, like, do I want to believe this thought? Does this really thought serve me? Does it help me in any way? Or is this making things worse? And so I think that's a really important piece. And I want to open it up to you. You've mentioned the visualization. You've mentioned being in the present moment. You've mentioned coming up with a plan for worries you have. Can you talk about what are some other things off the top of your head? If somebody, if a care blazer is feeling compassion fatigue or stress or whatever um, word you want to use, what are some things, realistic things they can do to try to help with that? I think it's important to acknowledge what's hurting. Mm -hmm. What's hurting right now? Name it. Mm -hmm. And then think, because this is hurting me right now, what can I do to feel better? And I often think we think, okay, well, I I need to go exercise or I need to do this. And sometimes to feel better, it's just to say, okay, I hurt. I'm going to sit and cry. I hurt. I'm going to take a break and go into the bathroom and cry. I hurt. So I need to rest on my bed for a few minutes. Self-care during caregiving is very different than it is outside of caregiving. And the messages that we hear are that, you know, we're not taking care of ourselves and we're neglecting our health. The reality is self-care during caregiving is peace of mind. What gives you peace of mind? That's what's most important. That peace of mind will help you minimize regrets. We have to live with ourselves after caregiving ends. And so we have to feel good about what we're doing now. So think about what can help you now in a way that is compassionate for yourself. What could you think? Could you take a glass of water and just hydrate just to give yourself that moment? And I also think we can ask ourselves a really good question. So if I am completely stressed out and thinking, oh my gosh, this situation is just awful. It's not gonna work out. I actually stop and ask myself a question. So last year I had a really difficult challenge and I finally figured out a good question to ask myself, which was, in what wonderful, marvelous, lucrative way will this work out for me? Now, if in the middle of this situation, it appeared that there was no way this was going to work out for me in a wonderful, lucrative way, but it ended up that it worked out in a marvelous, wonderful, lucrative way. So ask a question because then your mind will look for an answer. That's yeah. what's so fascinating about the mind is that it really is this amazing resource for us that we can use to our advantage. So yeah. think, take a moment and ask a question. Who could help me? Who yeah. could I talk to about this? How could I change this day for the better? How could I forgive myself? How could I start over? All these are great questions that actually reset the day for you. I love it. I think it's so important and th- it's amazing. And I think the important key about what you just said when it comes to asking questions and like the questions you then demonstrated, those are good questions, right? You don't want to ask yourself questions like, why is this happening to me? Why, why are things always, you know, going wrong for me? Your brain will find that evidence. You don't want it. But what you're saying is like, what would be the most kind thing to do right now? You know, how is this going to work out for me? You know, how can I show myself like those questions you just said, care blazer, pause, rewind, listen to what Denise just said, ask yourself those questions. Honestly, it's such a game changer because your brain, like you said, will start to look for answers when you ask it a question. And I think the other thing you said that's super important is like, you have to ask yourself like what's hurting, identify the feeling. And I think it is really hard and most people aren't taught that it's okay to feel especially when it's an uncomfortable feeling or a difficult feeling, we often want to just kind of push it away. And that's where we end up, you know, maybe turning to the tub of ice cream in the freezer or, you know, shopping online or watching a whole thing of Netflix or whatever the case may be. We like buffer away from those difficult feelings when the best and most healing thing you could do sometimes is just to acknowledge, like, I am really hurting right now. I am in pain right now. Right. And and what could I do right now to just show myself some love right here? And sometimes it might literally be just cry. And that is, that's okay. And that's an amazing uh, show of love and support for yourself rather than like pushing it away and stuffing it away makes it feel like you're not supposed to feel that way. Right. But we're human beings and care blazers are in such challenging situations. You know, watching a loved one slip away in front of your eyes. I don't know what 
is a more challenging situation, you know? So just allowing yourself, like, of course I'm hurting right now. I'm a human being and my loved one is, is, you know, disappearing. Like this is, this is sad and it's totally okay to feel that way. The grief is ever present. And I think sometimes what we do is we compare our situation to our carries and we decide, you know what, it's not that bad for me. So I should just power through. What am I doing? You know, having this emotional response, look at me, I'm in much better health than my carry. I should just let it go. The reality is, as you say, when we push it back in, we create our own pressure, right? We're then a pressure cooker that explodes. Right. It's important to say, you don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your journal. You can say it in your support group, in your Facebook group, where you say, today I hurt because of this. Yes. Something that's been helpful for me is to think about a daily healing plan. And I thought about it as a, as a process. So we're healing through something that hurts. We have the opportunity to heal with something that can help us feel better so that we can land in a better emotion. So this idea of healing through grief with support to peace Mm -hmm. then becomes a strategy that we can use. And we can play with the words so that regardless of how we feel, we can think, you know what, there's a strategy out there for me that can help me heal this hurt. Yeah, and I like it too. I, I think what we're speaking to in many ways is we're not trying to get rid of the pain and the hurt. We're trying to help you go through this process in a way where you're being kind and loving to yourself right? I think care blazers are so wonderful at showing compassion and love and kindness to their loved ones, yet sometimes forget themselves in that process and just kind of thinking about ways they can do that. So I love what you said, and you've given multiple examples, you know, journal, visualization, join a support group, have a glass of water, allow yourself to feel, ask yourself good questions. Like all of these things are really wonderful ways to just support yourself and love yourself through the caregiving process. I love this. And I think this is a good moment to bring up. You do have a book and it is about kind of this healing journey. Can you just share a little bit about the book and where care blazers could find it if they're interested? Yeah. So it's called healing words, soothing strategies for your caregiving fatigues. And in the book, I look at 12 specific fatigues that you might experience. Like you're tired of bad days. You're tired of feeling guilty. You're tired of trying, right? You just feel like, oh, I keep trying and it's not working. You're tired of feeling discouraged. You're tired of feeling like there's not support for you. So I offer strategies that can help you heal. And I share really stories of my own experiences in caregiving, both personally and professionally, to let you know that I've experienced that too. We yeah. all experience, experience these kinds of really deep emotions where we just feel like, oh, I hurt. Yeah. So I wanted the Healing Words book to feel like there are healing words in the book that can help you when you hurt and that you can be specific about what's hurting. Now in that specific, specific in the detail <laughs> of, of saying what it is that you is hurting you, you can find what can heal you. Yeah, I love it. And bringing it full circle, it has me thinking, you know, in the beginning, we talk about this umbrella term compassion fatigue that's really big and what you it sounds like are doing in your book is like you're breaking down all the different elements of that, whether it's decision fatigue, guilt fatigue, all of these other kinds of fatigues that would fall under that umbrella. That's a nice way to do it. And I did take a look at your book and read, I read through it and it, it really breaks down like specific things you could do if you are resonating with that fatigue. So yes. I'll be sure to link to it in the description below this video, Careblazer. I'll also, where can Careblazers find you if they want to learn more about you or follow you, where can they go? Yeah, they can go to my website, which is careyearsacademy.com. The name of my company is the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Okay, I'll be sure to link to that below. And I'll also link to the hospice video I did. I think that might be helpful for some people who want to go um, further into that. And Denise, I just really appreciate you coming on here and sharing a bit about your own caregiving journey and just uh, some really practical things that maybe some care blazers haven't really ever considered before could be helpful and like sharing that with them and encouraging it encouraging them to incorporate some of this into their daily lives. I think it's going to be incredibly helpful. So thank you so much for your time and for your expertise. Thank you, Natalie. This was so much fun. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. My pleasure. All right, Care Blazers. Bye. 
There you have it, Care Blazer. I hope you enjoyed this interview I did with Denise Brown. Again, I've linked all of her contact information below in the description, including a link to her book if you'd like to check it out. And don't forget, if you're interested in joining my care course, which is only offered a couple times a year, now is the time to join. The link is also below this video. Wishing you guys all the best. Take care. Bye.